Welcome back for part three of our lecture on gender dysphoria, sexual dysfunction, and paraphilic disorders. In part one, we defined key terms such as sex versus gender and reviewed the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in children, adolescents, and adults. In part two, we reviewed various types of sexual dysfunction, their prevalence, causes, and potential treatments. And in this, our final segment of this lecture, we will review several paraphilic disorders. There are several specific paraphilic disorders that we're going to highlight. We're focusing on these because they're relatively common in relation to some of the others, and some of them entail actions that are classified as criminal offenses. There are many dozens of distinct paraphilias that have been identified and named, and almost any of them could, by virtue of its negative consequences for the individual or for others, rise to the level of a paraphilic disorder. But it's important to note, while you must have a paraphilia to get a diagnosis of paraphilic disorder, merely having a paraphilia is not sufficient for a diagnosis. To get the diagnosis, you also need to have the negative consequences resulting from that paraphilia. For all of the paraphilia disorders, the first criteria, criteria gives us information regarding the nature of the paraphilia, intense sexually arousing fantasies, urges, or desires. And so we're looking at behavior that involves non-human objects, suffering or humiliation of a person, or ch involving children or non-consenting persons. There are many different types and patterns, and sometimes the individual has a paraphilia that is necessary for them to have arousal, but often it's something that is used periodically episodically in order to have arousal. It's also important to note that individuals can be and actually commonly are diagnosed with more than one paraphilia type. By and large, the paraphilias are much more common in men. In particular, for sexual sadism, there are 10 to 20 males for every one female that has that condition. And for all of the others, they are very, very, very rare among women. The first one is pedophilia. Here we see that over a period of at least six months, there are recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, sexual urges, or behavior involving sexual activity with a prepubescent child, generally 13 years or younger. The individual has acted on these sexual urges, urges or the sexual urges and fantasies cause them marked distress or interpersonal difficulty. The individual has to be at least 16 years old, and at least five years older than the child from criterion A. We do not include an individual in late adolescence that is having an ongoing sexual relationship with a 12 or 13 year old. Some of the specifiers we add, sexually attracted to males, typically these will be 12 to 15 year old males, and this type is particularly resistant to treatment, and they are much more likely to reoffend even if they've gone through treatment. In fact, the recidivism rates of those that are sexually attracted to males are twice that of those attracted to females. We would specify if sexually attracted to females, and typically the girls will be between eight to 10 years old, sexually attracted to both males and females, limited to incest, meaning the children that they perpetrate against are all relatives or within their family unit, Exclusive type would be those that are only sexually attracted to children and do not have any sexual attraction to other adults. And the non-exclusive type is someone who would be attracted to adults and to children. The population prevalence of pedophilic disorder is not well known. The highest possible prevalence in the male population is estimated to be three to 5%. The population prevalence of pedophilic disorder in females is uncertain, but it's likely to be a tiny, tiny fraction of the prevalence that we see in men. And it's also really important to emphasize that this is an abuse of power manipulation and control, and the gender of the child is not as important, and it's not directly linked with sexual identity or sexual orientation the way many people think. So most perpetrators, regardless of the child being male or female, are heterosexual men. So let me emphasize that again. Even the perpetrators in the sexually attracted to males category are likely to be heterosexual men. So there are many different stereotypes that gay men are likely to be pedophiles, that gay men are going to perpetrate against boys, that if somebody perpetrates against a boy, they must be gay. That is not at all the case. 
gay men have a very low rate of perpetration against others, especially pedophilia. Heterosexual men are the ones that have the highest risk of engaging in pedophilia. Voyeurism. This is our stereotypical peeping Tom. Over a period of the, at least six months, there have been recurrent and intense sexual arousal from observing an unsuspecting person who is either naked in the process of taking off their clothes or engaging in sexual activity. And this individual has fantasies, urges, and behaviors of watching somebody engage in these, in these activities. The individual has either acted on these sexual urges with a non-consenting person or the sexual urges and fantasies cause significant distress, impairment, or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning. The person needs to be at least 18 years of age to get this diagnosis. Importantly, there is no other type of sexual interaction sought with the person being watched. So the individual is likely to masturbate during watching the person or after as they fantasize and think about it again but they are not generally doing anything to initiate contact with the person they're watching. Voyeurism is the most common of the potentially law-breaking sexual behaviors. When we look at non-clinical samples and the rate of voyeuristic sexual acts, we expect that the highest possible lifetime prevalence for voyeuristic disorder is approximately 12% in males and 4% in females. For fetishism, we are looking for a period of at least six months where they've had recurrent and intense sexual arousal from either the use of non-living objects or a highly specific focus on a non-genital part of the body as manifested by their fantasies, urges, and behaviors. This causes them clinically significant distress or impairment and the fetish objects cannot be limited to articles of clothing that they use for cross-dressing or devices that are specifically designed for tactile genital stimulation. Some of the most common objects here would be women's clothing, such as underpants, bras, stockings, or shoes. They will often masturbate while holding, rubbing, or smelling these objects. Transvestic fetishism. Here, this is what we are often thinking about as cross-dressing, but cross-dressing for sexual arousal versus identity. Over a period of at least six months, they have recurrent and intense sexual arousal from cross-dressing as manifested by their fantasies, urges, or behaviors. This is causing them clinically significant distress or impairment. And some common examples would be someone dress, a man dressing in female underwear. Typically, they will masturbate while doing so. They may imagine themselves being both the male and the female in their fantasy. Again, this is typically going to be heterosexual men. And we add specifiers of with fetishism, if they're sexually aroused by fabrics, materials, or garments, and with autogynephilia, if they're sexually aroused by thoughts or images of themselves being the female in the interaction. We know, we know very little about the prevalence, but transvestic disorder is rare in males and extremely rare in females. Fewer than 3% of males report having ever been sexually aroused by dressing in women's attire. And the percentage of individuals who have cross-dressed with sexual arousal more than once, even a few times in their lifetimes, would be even lower. The majority of males with this disorder do identify as heterosexual, and they're not expressing a desire to change their gender. They're merely aroused by wearing those garments. I have to admit, frauderism is my favorite one to talk about because you will forever remember this lecture as a result of this particular disorder and it will come back to you when you have these kinds of events go on in your life and you will forever wonder if you were just frauded or not. So here we see that for six months they have had recurrent and intense sexual arousal from touching or rubbing against a non-consenting person as manifested by their fantasies, urges, or behaviors. The individual has acted on these sexual urges with a non-consenting person or the sexual urges, fantasies, cause them clinically significant distress or impairment. So note that this is different from some of the other ones. They did not mention that they've acted on it as they've merely said that they had clinically significant distress or impairment. But here, if they have actually acted on this, it means they have involved someone who did not consent to this sexual behavior, and that automatically will count for criterion B. So even if they don't have stress or impairment as a result, but they've involved someone in sexual behavior without their consent, then that is significant for criterion B. Frauderistic acts include uninvited sexual touching or rubbing against the individual. They, tend, they occur in up to 30% of males in the general population. 
and approximately 10 to 14 percent of adult males seen in outpatient settings for paraphilic disorders or hypersexuality have met criteria for frauderistic disorder. So we don't know the general population prevalence but it's not small. So imagine this, these are those events where perhaps you're in a crowded elevator and someone bumps into you. You assume that it was just because of the way the elevator moved or as they were trying to get off. But some of those events was someone deliberately bumping into you because it gave them sexual pleasure to do so. So now whenever you're in a space and someone bumps into you, you will have to wonder if you were frauded or not. Exhibitionism, here we're looking for six months where they have recurrent and intense sexual arousal from exposing their genitals to someone that was not suspecting that they were going to do so. They've either acted on this with a non-consenting person or their urges and fantasies are causing them distress and impairment. These individuals typically do not attempt to have any other type of sexual contact with the individual. They are aroused and enjoy the expression of shock and horror on the face of their victims. So they, this is kind of the flasher. They flash their genitals and then they get out of there quick. So here we'd specify whether they were sexually aroused by exposing their gen genitals to children or to physically mature individuals. And we do not have good prevalence data on this. However, based on exhibitionist sexual acts in non-clinical or general populations, the highest prevalence for this disorder in the male population is probably two to 4%, and for women, much, much lower. Sexual sadist. This is six months of recurrent and intense sexual arousal from the physical or psychological suffering of another person. They have either acted on these with a non-consenting person or the sexual urges or fantasies cause clinically significant distress or impairment. So this would include kind of the idea of the dominatrix and S&M, bondage, whips, or humiliation, like making somebody bark like a dog. The prevalence is unknown and is largely based on individuals in forensic settings. So depending on the criteria, criteria for sexual sadism, prevalence has been thought to vary as widely from two to 30%. Among civilly committed sexual offenders in the US, less than 10% have sexual sadism. But among those individuals who have committed sexually motivated homicide, the rates of sexual sadism range from 37 to 75%. In sexual masochism, here it's six months of recurrent and intense sexual arousal from the act of being humiliated, beaten, bound, or made to suffer. These cause clinically significant distress or impairment. Population prevalence of sexual masochism disorder is unknown, but one study in Australia estimated that 2.2% of males and 1.3% of females have been involved in bondage and disciplined behaviors within the last 12 months. Sexual arousal can be obtained from a wide variety of additional types of behaviors and objects. Sometimes people are able to satisfy those urges and desires on their own or with by paying somebody to participate with them if they need a willing partner. But some examples are listed here, like necrophilia, having sex with a corpse, Scatologia, those people that call, call on the phone and breathe really heavy. But pretty much if there's anything out there, there's, there's the potential that someone would have a sexual arousal pattern towards that object. The causes for paraphilias and sexual addiction are not always clear. They're typically going to be fairly complicated, but we do know that most people with paraphilias are heterosexual and male. This is very important to remember. We have lots of stereotypes about who a perpetrator is likely to be. The accurate information is important to know, and in this case, it is heterosexual men. People with paraphilias often will keep this information very, very private, which makes it very difficult to study. And there's also an assumption that this is born out of sexual abuse as a child, but only 30% of men and 60% of women with sexual addictions report sexual abuse as a child. So that means most men, 70%, have not had any childhood victimization. So we, we can't keep making that assumption. That's a stereotype. There are a variety of different approaches for treatment. But I want to emphasize once again, if the paraphilia involves consenting adults and they are not experiencing impairment or clinically significant distress, then merely having a paraphilia is not a problem and the person may not want or need to have treatment. When we're looking at treatment for paraphilias, it's typically court referred or somebody is being brought in by parents or a family member because it's causing 
impairment or it's involved a non-consenting person and gotten them in legal trouble. But absent that, it's okay for somebody to have a paraphilia. As a field, it's not the job of psychology to pathologize consenting adults engaging in mutually agreed upon behaviors that are not creating harm. So it becomes a problem when it's non-consenting people or when the person themselves is experiencing distress and impairment as a result of the urges in the behaviors. Under those circumstances, we would engage in a variety of different types of treatment approaches. We might engage in cognitive behavioral treatment, focusing on challenging any distorted perceptions a person may have of paraphilias and their impact on others. We might involve assisted covert desensitization, which typically pairs the arousing stimuli to potentially aversive consequences. This might be pairing it with electric shocks or something of that nature. There are even biological approaches, like an anti-androgen approach, which produces a medical castration and uses those medications to reduce the level of testosterone one has. Now, this is interesting because the anti-androgen approach would only work if they are in a confined setting where they can be forced to take the medications or if they themselves actually want to change. So it will not be helpful for those that do not want to stop their behavior, and it won't be helpful for violent offenders. Having a functioning sex organ is not what creates violent offending or involvement of non-consenting people. That is a decision to engage in power and control and misuse power in order to hurt others. Even individuals who are paralyzed from the waist down have been known to perpetrate against children, to engage in voyeurism, to do all of these various things. So we have to remember that once we are talking about sexual violence, or sexual manipulation that a medical or even a physical castration does not actually reduce their likelihood of hurting someone else or doing these acts. People can do them despite having a penis that does not work. And there's even some that suggest that the frustration from a castration or frustration from not being able to sexually perform could create even higher uses of violence within those acts. So the idea of castration, while it sounds like it should fix the problem, it actually does not unless the person is wanting to change. This is not only the final section of our lecture on gender dysphoria, sexual dysfunction, and paraphilic disorders, but it's also the final lecture for our class this semester. I hope you have enjoyed this course and have learned a bit about the vast array of factors that can impact our psychological well-being, the variety of ways in which psychological symptoms can manifest, and even a few things about how we can further improve our own psychological well-being. I hope you have increased your understanding of these disorders so you can critically evaluate how psychological distress and disorders are presented in our popular culture. Most of all, I hope you have increased your compassionate understanding of these conditions and your commitment to ending stigma related to managing them and seeking mental health care. Stay well.